Um, hola. <laughs> uh, my name is Sammy. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, when I was uh, 10 years old, uh, my mom uh, got me a computer. She spent every dime, every penny she had to buy me a computer so I had something to do during the summer. And we went to the store, she spent everything she had and, and bought this computer and we went home. And um, I set it up and I asked, hey mom, can I have the internet? And she said, okay. And she set up the internet for me and immediately I found dozens and dozens of websites about the X-Files. So I went on all these websites and I started downloading audio files of the X-Files and I started thinking, there have to be other people who want to chat with me about the X-Files. So I went to and I found a message board and I started talking to people on this message board about the X-Files, except after a post, you always have to hit refresh. So I'm waiting for hours and hours for someone to talk back to me about the X-Files. I'm like, there has to be a faster way. So then I found something called IRC, or Internet Relay Chat. And on IRC, you can go into a chat room and you can begin chatting with people immediately. So I went into a chat room and the first thing I asked was, hey, who wants to talk about the X-Files? And someone said, get out. And I said, what? And they said, you have 10 seconds to get out of this chat room. And I said, okay, person on the internet, I don't really know what you're talking about. And 10 seconds later, this happened. My computer that my mom has spent all of her money on had crashed and I freaked out. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. So I pulled the power from my computer. I waited for 20 minutes to let all the bad stuff go out of the computer. I didn't know how they worked. I still don't sometimes and I turned it back on. And after I turned it back on, thankfully everything still worked. But as the adrenaline was pumping through my veins, and I just imagined the, the power that this person had, I thought, that was the coolest thing ever. How do I do that? And that just brought me down a rabbit hole of uh, trying to understand what people are doing. And finally, after a lot of research, I found that someone was using something called WinNuke. And WinNuke, you could take someone's IP address and you could crash their computer. And once I learned this, Microsoft came out with a patch and they resolved this problem. And after some amount of time, I thought, well, if someone can make this software, can make this program, couldn't, can't I make that program? Now that Microsoft has patched this version of WinNuke, can't I make my own version that works a different way? And that's when I started learning about reverse engineering and exploiting software. And Throughout the years, I continued to um, play a lot of games. <laughs> instead, of, uh, instead of going to school, I ended up playing Counter-Strike a lot, um, to the point that in high school, I was just sitting at home, ignoring classes and playing Counter-Strike. And I remember one day that I was playing and I heard some footsteps. I heard footsteps coming be come up behind me. So I had two speakers. I had a, a left speaker and a right speaker, and someone was coming from the right speaker because I could, I could hear them on the right speaker. But I didn't see them in my radar, so they must have been an enemy. And as they went from the right speaker, they went to the left speaker, and then they shot me and killed me. But I realized there's information about where that person is. There's, when you're playing on the internet with someone else, there's, position about, uh, there's information about the position of that person from the right speaker to the left speaker. So I thought, I must be able to take that information I must be able to sniff it from network packets and then know where that person is. Because if my computer knows to play footsteps over here versus over here, then I should be able to show that. So that's when I began writing software. And I began to write software for Counter-Strike, specifically cheats. And those cheats let me see where people were in the map. Um, or you know, for more fun, I was able to just see through walls um, and kind of see everything that was going on. And this really got me into reverse engineering, where I could take a system, try to break it down, try to understand all the information available, and then exploit that in an interesting way. So throughout the years, after that, I was able to get a job because of, at this point, I was releasing open source software. I was releasing it for free online. Um, anyone could download it. And finally, someone asked, hey, do you want to work with our company? I was 15 years old. And I had learned that writing software, you can actually make money. 
Um, and a few years later, I learned about another website. And this website is called MySpace. Um, you may remember MySpace. You used to have like really interesting profiles like this one. I think this was my profile. Um, so if anyone has had a MySpace, you might be familiar with this. Now, on MySpace, there were all sorts of things you could do. You could upload pictures. You could have comments, leave comments on people's walls. Um, and on one of the things that you could do, you could basically be in a relationship. And you can select a relationship status. So for example, you might be single, in a relationship, married. And in mine, I had in a relationship. And I wanted to say something else. I actually wanted mine to say in a hot relationship. So I thought, OK, how am I going to do this? And unfortunately, it's just a drop down. You can only choose from these available options. So I started looking through the, web, through the website, through MySpace, and I discovered that there was a vulnerability. There was something that would allow me to execute code within the website. Now, by executing that code, I could actually modify the contents of the page in any way. I could change any text. So I changed my text from in a relationship to in a hot relationship. But as I was doing that, I realized because I can inject code, because I can inject this JavaScript code onto the page, I can actually make the user's browser do anything. And from there, I realize I can do some other things. I can make someone, for example, add me as a friend. So if someone visits my profile, they'll add me as a friend without even knowing it. And it was around this time, this was 2005, so about 10 years ago, who remembers MapQuest? Did anyone use MapQuest? I'm not sure if they had some MapQuest. OK, awesome. <laughs> uh, and around this time, something else came out. And it was Google Maps. And to me, Google Maps changed the internet. It was the first time on the internet that you could take something and you can just drag. And you could drag around. You know, Back on MapQuest, if you wanted to zoom, you'd have to press a button. The page would refresh, and it would zoom. If you wanted to go east, you'd have to click the east button. The page would refresh, and then it would load the new thing. But Google Maps was this amazing interface where you could just zoom in and zoom out and scroll around. It was beautiful. And that was using something called Web 2.0, or Ajax. And I thought, this thing is really cool. How can I use this in the MySpace stuff I'm doing? So as I did more research, I found that not only could I make someone add me as a friend or change the text within my profile, um, I could add something to the person's profile. So when so someone visits my profile, now I also made it add, but most of all, Sammy is my hero to their profile. And I thought, this is kind of funny. So now, when someone visits my profile, they'll add me as a friend, and they'll also add Sammy as my hero to their profile. And I thought, OK, after some time, after enough people visit my profile, I'll have a bunch of new friends on MySpace. Unfortunately, I didn't. I waited a few days, and I had maybe one new friend on MySpace when I suspected a, a couple more would happen. So I thought, OK, if I can make someone add me as a friend, and I can make someone add me as a hero, couldn't I take the code and add it to their profile? So if you visit my profile, you'll add me as a friend and add me as a hero. But the code will also copy onto their profile. So if someone visits their profile, they'll add me as a friend and add me as a hero. So if that happens, if let's say five people add me, then the next day, if five people all go to their profiles, that should be 25 new people. So by the morning, I released this worm or virus, and I thought, by tomorrow, I should have like six new friends. Um, and after about the next morning, I woke up, and I woke up to 200 new friends. And I realized that this virus had basically gone a lot faster than I thought. I had maybe 20 friends on MySpace, and the next morning, I had 200. And I thought, wow, eight hours with 200 new friends. In eight, another eight hours, I must have another 200, except it was doubling every hour. So it was exponential, like a worm is. So two hours in, I had maybe 1,000, and then another 2,000, 4,000, and 8,000. Uh, by around lunchtime, I had 10,000 new people who have added me on MySpace. And I thought, well, I can't really stop this, so I'm going to uh, enjoy whatever freedom I have, go and get a burrito, have lunch, um, and then hopefully, hopefully, MySpace doesn't come after me. At the same time, MySpace had recently been purchased by Fox for $500 million. 
and I was hoping that they wouldn't come after me. Um, so at this point, I went to, uh, went to lunch, and I came home, and I had over 900,000 people following me, or 900,000 new friends on MySpace. Uh, essentially, it was doubling at every hour until around a million. I was refreshing to now just find out how many people are actually being infected by this virus. And at around a million, finally, I refreshed, and my profile had been taken down. So I went, and I was happy, like, finally, they've taken down my profile. I went to myspace.com, I went to the main page, and I realized, oh no, the whole website is down. So the entire website of MySpace, at the time the number one website on the internet, was actually down because of this virus. And I felt awful. Uh, I live in Los Angeles, so I thought MySpace is also in Los Angeles, maybe I should go and say hello and apologize. But uh, I didn't really want to cause any other trouble. Uh, so. After, I basically wrote a blog post, and I, I wanted to show, you know, this whole thing was non-malicious. I was 19 years old at the time. And I described, essentially, what I was doing, how it worked, and also a technical explanation of how it worked. So if people wanted to learn how this virus worked, uh, they'd be able to learn. And soon enough, people were asking, basically, were asking me, are you the Sammy that created this worm? And um, started doing blog posts and trying to break down the virus more and more. Um, someone asked me that, if I knew that they were selling Sammy's My Hero t-shirts. I'm like, uh, I didn't know that, but that's very cool. And one day, so a month goes by, and two months go by, and three months go by, and nothing happens. MySpace doesn't come after me, the police don't knock down my door, and six months go by, and I think, okay, I got away scotch-free. Like, I didn't intend to write a virus or intend to write a worm. However, uh, I guess uh, I did. <laughs> and at that point, I thought, no one had come after me after six months, so I was in the clear. Until one day, I went down to my car, and I saw two people, two guys standing next to my car. And I had just gotten a new car, so I thought, oh no, I'm getting carjacked. Someone's going to try to steal my car. So I go up to the car, and the two guys say, Sammy? And I'm like, what? I'm like, oh man, carjackers don't know your name. These guys know my name. And as I walk up, two other guys come behind me. And they say, Sammy? I'm like, yeah? They say, we have a search warrant for your, uh, for your house. And I say, oh no. So I say, I watch a lot of TV, and they always say, show me the search warrant. So I said, show me the search warrant. And finally, they showed me the search warrant. And they talked to me for about half an hour. And finally, I was like, guys, if you want to do a search, if you want to do whatever you need, let's, let's go ahead and do it. So we finally walk upstairs, and uh, there are about a dozen agents in my house. And I started asking where they're from. And one's the United States Secret Service. Uh, another is the district attorney, uh, the Electronics Crimes Task Force, and for some reason, the California Highway Patrol, probably because of my sweet car. So at this point, finally something from the movie Hackers was real. You actually get raided with, with people with guns for hacking, for computer hacking, a social network. At this point, they go through my computer, they go through my laptop, they take my laptop, they take my cell phone, my Xbox, my DVDs, my CDs, my iPod, anything that has a computer chip or data on it, they then took. They left me with a search warrant, which at no point did we ever talk about MySpace. I was hoping it was MySpace and not something else. So finally, I'm reading through the search warrant, and I read at some point it says MySpace. I'm like, OK, good. At least it's about this and not something else. And finally, they take my computer. And a dozen people at the same time, I'm reading through, and, and they're showing all the places that they're allowed to search. And they're allowed to search my home address, my car, my body, and one other address. And I realize the other address is my work. So I ask, you guys are going to go to my office? And they're like, we're already there. So another dozen agents broke into my office and started taking all the computers. Uh, at some point, the CEO begged with them to try to just take my stuff so the, that the company wouldn't go under. But once they took all of this stuff, I then went to court. And for six months, I basically fought with the government. 
um, fought with the Los Angeles District Attorney. And ultimately, they said that I was not allowed to touch a computer for three years. So no computer use for three years, um, some amount of restitution that I would have to pay the government, uh, probation, which means every week I have to check in with a probation officer, and a lot of community service where I got to pick up trash and make uh, 720 hours, which felt like a lot more. Um, this was all because of the Patriot Act. And what was interesting was MySpace actually never came after me. Uh, MySpace tried to hire me to help with their security, ultimately. Uh, but it was the US government that actually came after me for this virus. So after about three years of perfect behavior, um, I was able to go to court and get the computer use restriction removed. So finally, I could get back on computers. And I thought, OK, this is amazing. I better not screw it up. Um, so how do I use computers in a fun way? And all of this, you know, to me, I was never black hat. Um, I just always had, a, I had just a, a curiosity of how technology worked. And I think it was really cool that we have so much available to us today. We have so much technology, so much that we can create from nothing, from so little. It doesn't require a lot of resources. It doesn't require a lot of education. Um, and it doesn't require a lot of money. And I think that's so, so, you know, so cool. And to me, hacking, you know, hacking and reverse engineering is like a puzzle. When you're doing a puzzle, when you take, let's say, a puzzle and a, a, a paper or a crossword, you're solving something that someone intended for you to solve. They created something so that you could actually resolve this and come to a solution. Hacking is like such an interesting puzzle to me because no one intended for you to find that solution. No one intended for you to actually solve that or to do something. So it's so much more applicable in real life, and it's so powerful. So once I got back to computers, I thought, OK, how am I going to do things that will be interesting you know, sort of solve my need for that curiosity and for that type of hacking, but also make some interesting changes. Um, and also demonstrate some of the issues that, that are common today. So a few years ago, um, Amazon said they were going to start doing things with drones, that they were going to start flying packages around with drones. And I think drones are a really cool technology. However, uh, one thing I'd like to prevent is, let's say, I don't necessarily see drones flying down my street. I don't necessarily believe that's a good thing. So I started doing some research, and I found that the Parrot AR drone at the time, the most ubiquitous consumer-based drone, could actually be hacked. So I could actually take full control of this drone. So I created something called Skyjack. And essentially, Skyjack is a drone that's built to hack into other drones. So you can take a small computer, a Raspberry Pi computer, load some open source software that I've built onto that computer, you attach it to your own drone, and you fly your drone around. And while your drone is flying around, it's detecting the wireless signal of any other drone around. And if it detects that wireless signal, it hacks into that drone and then takes it over. So if you see a bunch of other drones, you can fly your drone around, take over all of these drones, and they become your zombie drones that you now have full control over, just like flying around wherever. And this is really just to demonstrate, you know, as we're actually using these things, People can actually abuse this technology. Um, we sh if we're actually releasing things that are, you know, a, a drone like this is only a few hundred dollars. Anyone can purchase one. And some of these things, they're not, they're not toys, right? They can go very fast. They can go very high. They can carry payloads. Um, if we have this type of security vulnerability in a drone today, what will happen tomorrow when we're actually using them in industries, when we're actually using them to deliver packages to every person on a street? And I think there's so many other interesting areas of technology and security. Um, one of the th cool things that came out of MIT was uh, something called Gadar. And basically, Facebook Gadar could go onto Facebook and detect whether someone was gay or straight based off information that they revealed without actually telling you whether they're, let's say, gay or straight. They wouldn't tell, if someone's uh, Facebook doesn't even have their sexuality based off other information. We're actually constantly leaking all sorts of information about ourselves, even if we otherwise would want to hide that or keep that secret, or ne not necessarily keep that o open to everyone. Um, so it's just some, like a amazing things you can do with just the information that's available. One of my favorite sites out there is pleaserobme.com. 
This is a website that scours the social networks. So it'll go on Facebook, it'll go on Twitter, it'll go on Foursquare. And let's say, for me right now, I went on Twitter and I said, I'll be in Madrid, uh, lucky to be at CyberCamp speaking. And Please Rob Me will say, oh, by the way, Sammy Kampkar is in Spain right now, go rob him. No one's at his house, you can now break into his house and you'll be fine. Right? This is the information that we're constantly giving out. Matt Honan is another really interesting case. Um, he's an editor at Wired. And one morning, he woke up to his entire digital life being gone, being hacked. Hackers were able to get into his Amazon account, which is not a big deal, because on Amazon, all you can do is maybe order some books. Except they saw in the billing section the last four digits of his credit card number. They then called Apple. And they said, oh no, I lost my iCloud password. How can I get back into my account? And what did iCloud, what did Apple ask him? They asked him for the last four digits of his credit card number. So he gave up those four digits, gave them to Apple. Apple let him into his iCloud, let these hackers into his iCloud. The hackers quickly got into his iCloud, got into his MacBook, got into his iPad, got into his iPhone, went into his email, changed all of his passwords, broke into his Twitter, into his Facebook, deleted everything off his MacBook, iPad, iPhone, he was left with nothing, and they started sending tweets at him. Like, literally, his entire digital life taken over overnight because of this, because of four digits, a credit card, the four digits at the end of a credit card number, information that is on every receipt that we have. Another one is McAfee. Uh, John McAfee from McAfee Antivirus. You know, he, at some point a few years ago, he was on the lam. He was on the run uh, for suspicion of killing his neighbor. And a vice writer actually went with him. And they started going who knows where because they wouldn't say where they were going. But John McAfee was trying to escape. And as they were leaving, they were sort of the vice writer was documenting this entire process of them leaving the country and going other places. And they also released this image. But they forgot to remove the GPS information from the camera. Whenever you take a picture with your phone, with your Android device, with many of these cameras, they have GPS built in. So that information is in the image. And they totally forgot. They released this image with the GPS information. Two days later, he was caught. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so I've, I've built similar apps, just to demonstrate this, that follow my friends on Twitter. So you can pull up your name on this app, and it'll show you everywhere you've been, and just a map as well as all of the images and in the order. <clears throat> so you can just scroll across time and see where people have been. So much other information is collected. Um, one of the really cool things that I found a few years ago was HTML5 geolocation came out. And basically, this is a feature within browsers where you can write JavaScript code, and you can actually see where someone is. So you'll go to a website, and it will say, would you like to allow this place to know your location? Now, normally, if you say deny, they won't be able to get that information. But I went and I clicked allow. And this website knew exactly where I was. It knew the physical address of where I was at that point. And I thought, how does it know? How does it know so accurately where I am? And that's because of street view cars. Basically, street view cars are driving around everywhere. And not only are they taking pictures for street view, but they're also collecting Wi-Fi information, Wi-Fi signal information. So every Wi-Fi router, every router out there has a unique MAC address, something unique to it and nothing else. And as it's collecting this information, it's also collecting GPS coordinates. So if there's a Wi-Fi router here called CyberCamp, and a Google Street View car starts driving down the road, it'll start detecting that Wi-Fi signal. And it'll also start detecting the signal strength of that Wi-Fi router. So not only does it know that there's a Wi-Fi router around, but as it's driving down and det detects a stronger and stronger signal, it knows I'm getting closer and closer and closer. And as it drives away, it knows it's getting weaker and weaker and weaker and knows that it's here because of that. Now, it knows it's somewhere around here. And as it turns and detects that same information, now it knows exactly where it is because now it can triangulate that information. And this was crazy. I mean, it, it allowed such accurate coordinates. And I was in Slovakia, and I was talking about how Google was able to do this. And because of this, you could actually find where anyone was at any point. Because you could just send someone's MAC address and get an up-to-date uh, information about their exact coordinate, the exact physical location that that person was, whether they're on a laptop, a desktop, or a phone, it didn't matter. 
And in Slovakia, they, they told me that it was actually illegal to have Google Street View cars. So that Street View shouldn't, so that this should not be a problem. There should not be any way to locate where someone physically is. So we did the test, and we actually found that Google Street View, or not Street View, but this did work. So if someone visited my malicious page, I knew their physical address just by browsing to a website. So I thought, how would Google do this? They clearly, they're probably not having these illegal Street View cars come because someone would notice those cars. What else does Google have that's everywhere? And that's Android. So what if Android was doing this? And after going through Android's source, and I found nothing in Android was actually doing this. And then I discovered that Android itself, while it's open source, does have some components that are closed source. And this component that was installed on every Android phone out there that's closed source is actually taking your GPS coordinates, taking all of the unique identifiable information about the routers around and sending it to Google. And I thought, this is crazy. That means basically all of our Androids are just war driving. And then I looked at iPhone, and iPhone was doing the same thing. And then Microsoft. Microsoft Windows phones are doing the same exact thing. And what's crazy is if you turn off GPS on a Microsoft phone, or if you turn off location services on an iPhone, they continue to collect this information. They continue to collect where you are. They collect all the information about every router around you. So if you don't even have a smartphone, if you're on a flip phone or a BlackBerry for some reason, and someone drives by you with an iPhone, your router is now in the database because your router has wireless. All, that's all it takes. And it will go into that database along with your GPS coordinates. And I thought this was crazy. Basically, all of our devices are just like war driving machines. They're constantly, constantly sniffing for all this information and uploading in databases that are accessible by anyone. So I thought it'd be cool to do a demonstration. So one of the actual cool features of Google is that while they're collecting all this information, they're also collecting how fast you're moving. So if you're driving down a road at 20 kilometers per hour, they know that you're driving at 20 kilometers per hour on this road. And they use that information for, for Google Maps uh, traffic. So when you're actually looking at traffic patterns, that's based off people's Android's dev Android devices. And I thought, OK, if they're collecting all this information, can I control that information? And I found that I can actually control Google's traffic. So I developed a proof of concept app. And I would put in a source and destination. Like if I want to go from you know, uh, this location down to somewhere in downtown, I would put in the source and destination. It would tell me the directions. But it would ultimately send thousands of requests to Google telling everyone is going zero miles per hour along this route. And then everyone else who would see my route would just see traffic on my route. And they would get diverted to other roads. And I would just have a basically empty road. Um, so just like so much information that we're constantly giving out. Uh, and I think there's, there's so much more that we can find and so much more that needs to be researched. I mean, what are our routers telling? What's, what are our browsers? What are all the plugins that we use? All of the software, what are they giving out? Uh, this is a cool quote from uh, uh, Adam Laurie. He's a, a well-known hacker. In my experience, once data becomes invisible, something magical happens. They forget about security. I think this is really, this is really powerful. Um, one of the cool, there's so many attacks that we just don't know about or don't think about. And that's capable with low cost hardware. Um, this is a, a Tempest attack. I mean, the Tempest attack was published uh, 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 privately by the NSA in the 1970s. And that was when they were basically able to view electromagnetic radiation from a monitor, from a CRT screen, from a different room. They could be in another room and see what's on your monitor just from radiation. Absolutely incredible. And today, we have so many low-cost attacks that are available to do such crazy things, things that you'd see in spy movies or you know, really bad hacker movies that couldn't be real but are absolutely real. Um, some guys at Inverse Path were able to do a really cool attack where they would take a simple laser, a $2 uh, red laser, and bounce it off of a laptop or bounce it off of something that vibrated. And that, that vibration, they would then they'd take the reflection of the laser and have it hit a photo sensor, something that could pick it up, is a picture of them. And based off the vibration from the actual monitor, from, key, from typing keys on the keyboard, they could take that vibration and turn it back into 
keystrokes. They would know what you're typing. Just by knowing the language you're typing, the unique vibrations of all of the keys plus frequency analysis, letter frequency analysis, they would know what you're typing on a keyboard just from that image. There's a new camera out called the FLIR. It's an infrared camera. This was one of the coolest, most simple attacks I've ever seen. They put a little camera on their iPhone. They go up to a store or an ATM. They take a picture right after someone used it. And you can see the heat signature from the buttons that were pressed. And you now extracted their ATM pin from a $200 camera that you can buy today and, and put on your phone. It's hardly noticeable. Um, some incredible attacks with some like basic technology. Uh, there was a research group that was able to show that was ap actually able to track keyboard keystrokes. So similar to the attack using the laser pointer, they were able to take a standard mobile phone, put it in a room, and hear someone typing somewhere else. And the unique vibration, the unique sound and characteristics of every key on the keyboard, because they each are in a unique location on that keyboard, produce a unique sound. And using software, they were able to extract every single keystroke that that person was typing in the room, even though they had no visibility of the screen or the keyboard. Um, absolutely incredible. And what, what amazes me is that this is something that we all have access to. Every single one of us has one of these devices, right? They're inexpensive, at least reasonably. I mean, I guess we never thought we'd buy $600 cell phones a few years ago, but now we have to have them. But we all have it. We all have access to this kind of technology and so much we can create. Uh, another, another awesome proof of concept was someone who was able to extract passwords and keystrokes and emails if you ran their software. So if you ran their program on your, let's say, iPhone or Android, and you went into Gmail and you started typing an email, based off how your phone would move, based off the accelerometer data, they were able to say, oh, well, if you're going to type an A, you're more likely to tilt it this much versus an S, where you're going to type, tilt it slightly less. Or a Q, you're going to tilt it this way. And they could, based off how you're tilting your phone, they would extract your PIN, your passwords, all, everything you're typing in emails. I mean, absolutely incredible. Uh, a group in, uh, from uh, Tel Aviv University uh, actually did this research at, where they could do acoustical intelligence. They could actually use, again, a mobile phone, a standard mobile phone. The microphone in our phones are capable of listening to audio outside of the human hearing range. They're actually able to listen all the way up to ultrasound, to some levels of ultrasound. All of our computers, the capacitors and resistors around the CPU, they make noise. We don't hear it because it's an ultrasound. But when you're, let's say, encrypting an email with, with PGP or GPG, those encryption routines are running operations on your processor, on your microcontroller. All of that is loading power into those capacitors around the processor. That power is producing ultrasound. Based off that ultrasound, if you can listen to it, which you can with a mobile device, you can then know what instructions and operations that computer is running. And from meters away, from meters away from the computer, you can set your mobile device to listen to those capacitors. And it will start to detect not only the operations that are running, but if it detects GPG or PGP encryption, let's say you're encrypting your email, it can extract the entire key. The entire PGP key can be extracted from a standard mobile device from meters away. Again, this is technology we have access to. We, have, we all have phones. We all can run this software. Um, it's absolutely crazy. Circuits are another amazing thing. We have so many ground leaks. Whenever you're typing on a keyboard, your keystrokes are going down a wire, let's say on a desktop computer. If you're typing on a keyboard, your keystrokes are, share, are shared on this line, shared with a ground line. So information can actually go from your serial line over the ground into your computer. If your computer is plugged into the wall, then it's plugged into the ground of the wall, which is plugged into every other outlet, every other electrical outlet that has ground on that circuit. So if you go into a room or an office, you can plug a device in, and from the ground, you can listen to all the other leak, leaky computers and devices on any, on any other computer in that circuit. 
That means you can actually see the keystrokes that people are typing. If they're using a wired keyboard on a wired computer that's wired to the electrical circuit, you can see the keystrokes they're typing, right? That's a computer that could, might not even be on the internet. It might not be, be on a network. It might be entirely separate. All right, this is one of the, the, the most fun attacks that I've ever seen. If you ever see a bag of chips, be worried. Researchers were able to basically take a camera, a DSLR camera, and they took a bag of potato chips and they put it in a room, a soundproof room with soundproof glass. Then they left the room, entirely soundproof. They put someone else in the room, and there are two, two people in the room who are now talking, and you can't hear what they're saying. All you can see are their faces and this bag of chips sitting on the table, and they use a standard DSLR camera. They're now looking through soundproof glass at a bag of potato chips in the soundproof room with a DSLR camera. They're taking that, that video and piping it to a computer. And now they're looking for changes in the bag of potato chips. Sound is just vibration of air, right? When we're talking, all we're doing is we're vibrating the air, and that's traveling. It travels far enough and strong enough that it can minutely change the foil in a bag of potato chips. It will just like minutely move. The naked eye probably can't see it. A DSLR camera and a computer can. They then extracted the changes, the very small changes in the bag of potato chips, and they were able to take that, convert that visual change back into a frequency, an audible frequency, and play sound from the soundproof room by looking at a bag of chips. I will never look at a bag of chips the same. E-cigarettes, <laughs> someone purchased an e-cigarette from eBay. They got it, they put in their favorite juice in there, e-juice, they smoked it. They smoked it so much they had to recharge it. So they plugged it into their computer and it dropped malware onto their computer. Took over their computer, gave access to someone else to just take over their computer from an e-cigarette. I mean, our phones, all of our phones are running operating systems that are so powerful. Um, I was at a phone company for a while and I developed a, a proof of concept, uh, basically an exploit that would exploit common voice over IP phones. It would turn them on, it would turn the microphone on, it would send me everything, but it wouldn't notify the user that it was ever on. So it looked like you had a phone that was just in your office, just waiting for a call, but it was on a call. And it was on speakerphone and I could hear everything. And this was exploitable. I didn't have to run malware, I didn't have to install anything on your phone. All your phone needed was an IP address. Today, all of our phones have IP addresses. All of our phones are exploitable. So many um, RFID and key fobs and ways to get into buildings. Um, all of these can be easily sniffed, they can be emulated, you can emulate RFID. So many tools that you can just go up to buildings that we think we have so much security around us. And time and time again, we're demonstrating how you can break this, how you can, how when you're walking around with a badge or a card, if that's able, that's able to actually emanate a field, an RF field with a unique identifier that says, you know, you are you or I am me. And with that information, I can just come up and if I have a device, I can swipe, I can swipe your information. Um, I can take that and I can pretend to be you. Our wireless keyboards, so many places are using wireless keyboards that I mean, let's think about that for a moment. We actually have keyboards with keystrokes, all, everything we're typing. So many things I type, I don't want people to find out if you only knew what I was typing. Um, so many keystrokes that are just getting sent wirelessly. Here's a device that can sniff every keystroke of every Microsoft wireless keyboard around. It just looks like a USB charger. If you see this thing, I don't, it, might, it might be charging USB devices or it might be sniffing keystrokes from all of these wireless keyboards. Uh, so much cool radio frequency stuff. Um, a device I love is from Mattel. It's called the IME. And this is a spectrum analyzer that Michael Osman wrote. He was able to modify and hack this device so that it could actually read the entire sub gigahertz spectrum. That means it can pick up all sorts of information. It could basically see how garages open. It could sniff that. It could replay that. It could open garages. It can unlock cars and start cars. There's so much stuff that we can do with just like simple devices from these, um, from these massive manufacturers. And just another, another really cool area is cars. 
think Charlie Miller and Chris Valsek showed you know the first um, the first amazing like incredible hack of an of an unaltered vehicle this past summer. They were able to through a series of exploits on a current Jeep, I believe a 2014 unaltered Jeep. They were able to traverse over the internet through the Sprint network into the infotainment system through a couple of sections through there, into the radio, onto the CAN bus, onto two separate CAN buses, and start just sending communication and start controlling the car. They're able to change the radio, control, <laughs> control the, the windshield wipers, and then just turn off the vehicle. They turned off the engine with this poor guy, Andy Greenberg, uh, driving in it live on a, on a freeway. There's so much out there and so much information. And I think one of the coolest things one of the most exciting things for me is that all of this is available with low cost hardware and software. Any of us can do it, right? Anyone out there can do it. It doesn't require a formal education. There's so much information out there. Um, so much that we can learn how to secure and how to insecure, right? How to reverse engineer, how to break. Um, and I really, hope, I really hope more and more people get into this stuff, uh, either the hacking or the securing. You know, security is hard. Uh, and obviously, with all these attacks, I don't want to leave you insecure. So this is what I suggest if you ever need some additional security, um, a pretty good demonstration from Inverse Path. But it's, it's up to us to basically uh, to see whether you want to dig down and go into areas that people haven't looked at. You know, what I'm hoping for is that people will start to research more and start to find more ways of securing, find more methods of, and techniques of exploitation because there are also plenty of bad guys doing the same thing. Plenty of bad guys who are getting funded by corporations, governments, criminals, mafia, who are all funding all sorts of hacking uh, and reverse engineering. So it's up to us to also find those same techniques. And uh, I hope some of you will, will join me in that. So thank you so much, and thank you for having me. <laughs> Also, if there are any questions. I'm not sure if there's a microphone. Is there any microphone? Awesome. Hola. Cuando, Hello. Uh, when, when you, you find some flaw in a software and it can be exploited, uh -huh. do you approach the company? What, what is the response from them? Do, are they happy about it? Do they? Answer to you say, you know, that's interesting. We didn't know that about our software, or they push you away and say, that's bad. You've that's, been a bad boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. They don't want to hear sometimes. Uh, that's a good question. That's a good question. It, it depends on the company. More and more, we have companies who are now actually have bounty programs, right? They actually embrace hacker, the hackers and hacker community to come and uh, provide those. And they even pay you. Right? You don't even have to sign a contract or anything. As long as you don't steal customer data or disrupt service, you know, companies like Facebook will give you money, will give you bug bounties in Google. Um, and then there are some companies who will say bad boy. Right? They'll, they'll, they might, you know, some companies will try to have you arrested if they can. Um, so it really depends on the company. Uh, when I started communicating with some of the vehicle, the larger vehicle manufacturers, none of them were prepared. They're just not prepared for this type of communication. Um, actually, they're starting to. So they had cybersecurity officers that they've hired in the last year. So they're a little open to it, but there's no way to really contact them. It, it really takes like actually trying to get in touch with the right people in some of these companies is very difficult. So I'd say more and more people are now embracing the fact that this is like a, a necessary thing. And if you don't listen, if you ignore this, you're, you're going to experience every company gets hacked. Every single company gets hacked. I've worked in enough companies that have had enough hacks, some private, some public. Um, and if you can embrace, if you can accept that information now, before it becomes something bad, it becomes someone malicious, who then leaks customer data of thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people, you know, it, hopefully you can embrace it. Yeah. Any, uh, anyone else? Yes. Uh, is the microphone? Cool. Thank you. My name is Ismail. Uh, I just want to ask you, in your opinion, which is the difference between freedom, being under control, 
and being secure. Thank you. For, uh, I'm sorry, between fr uh, freedom and, and what? Control. Control. Because it seems like uh, everything under control could be our securitization in terms of uh, uh, civil people, uh, uh, all this area. So what is, in your opinion, the freedom? So would like an example of encryption be, be an example, would encryption be an example of that? Like how, you know, certain governments want to actually have backdoors in our encryption, right? Um, I mean, I think that's, that's kind of an issue today. Uh, I think, uh, I would say there are certain things that I think we should have freedoms of, right? I think the communication, right? Uh, the ability to have privacy, I think is important. Um, I also believe in transparency, but I'd say let's say let's use encryption as an example. I think it's very important to have strong encryption. Uh, we have governments that are saying they want backdoors in encryption, and only the government can use strong encryption. But of course, if we start backdooring everything, who knows what other bad actors might find that backdoor? Who knows who else might be able to exploit that? And we're not going to know. That's the scariest part. You're not going to know when a bad actor finds something and is able to exploit that. So I think we should think with more freedom and more security. Uh, and I don't think freedom and control are necessarily uh, you know, mutually exclusive. Um, you can still, I think you can still control plenty. You can control, let's say, some flow of information. Uh, but there are certain things like privacy that I believe are important, encryption are important. And I am definitely more on that side, on the freedom side. Up there. Hola. Uh, Hola. First of all, uh, great talk. Congratulations. Thank you. So, yeah, during your talk, you mentioned uh, getting educated, right? Mm. So, do you have any recommendations of people to get started? I mean, there's a lot of like reverse engineering, uh, learning how things work, hardware that it developed, but. Be, there's so much information online. How to be selective? Where would you advise someone where to start? Like forums, um, any sure. specific books? Uh, yeah. what, what would you like? Can you give me an example of something you'd like to be uh, better at uh, or good at? Let's say, for example, uh, break into routers or okay. understanding how they work. OK. OK. Um, so I would say uh, doing it yourself. Like trying to break a router, right? Have a goal. I think that's, that's the number one thing, is having an actual goal. Once you know your goal, let's say it's to break a router, right? Go home, look at the router you have, look at the manual, go through the web interface, look at all the features, and then start looking at how have other people broken routers? How have other people exploited routers? So from there, you're just going to do a search, probably a generic search, a Google search. You're probably only going to find a, a dozen, maybe a dozen top ways of breaking into a router, right? There's probably some cross-site scripting out there. There's probably some firmware exploits. Recently, there have been a couple of router issues where they've had passwords that are automatically generated. I would say it's really like a Google search to find what else have people done. And then as you're learning those methods and techniques, let's say you learn how to break into a router via cross-site scripting, one method. Now that you've understood and you've learned this, this technique to attack a router, Whenever you work on a new project, maybe tomorrow you're working on breaking into a cable modem or breaking into a website, you can use all of those techniques, all of those things that you learned from the router information to, to then apply somewhere else. Um, I wouldn't give you any specific locations. I would say wh when I learned, uh, I dropped out of high school. I had no formal education in any of this. So for me, it was also just learning online, and it was also testing, and then also just failing a lot. Like, I fail most of the time when I try things. Um, but I find that with every failure, I'm learning something new that will then help me in, in the future, in a, a future attack or future software or hardware that I create. Um, and then if there were like, if I had to point you in one place to look, I would say certain magazines or uh, uh, there's <clears throat> something called POC or GTFO, which is a current you know, magazine or e-zine that you can look at. Frack is something I grew up on and had a lot of, had a wealth of information. So. I say read Frack. It, there's like 50 issues, so I mean that'll take up all your time. But that's that's the place I would start. Yeah, good. 
wait. Yeah. One, one thing more. Congratulations on Max Poof. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was happy to release that this week. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, congratulations. Uh, first of all, with everything you know, how do you manage your time to know and learn and test all you know right now? Um, how did I manage it? Um, I'm, uh, I'm not sure. I think it's really maybe allocating. It's, it's more about low-hanging fruit, right? I kind of look at the areas that I think that I make estimations are going to be more, more vulnerable. When, when Charlie Miller and Chris Valsek were looking at the Jeep, they chose the Jeep specifically. <clears throat> they chose it because it had more features than almost any car in that price range. <clears throat> it had all sorts of parallel parking features. It had lane assist. It had drive assist. It had you know dynamic cruise control. It had all of these features that most other vehicles didn't. So all they did, they said, was they assumed that if, with, if you have all these new features, you're going to have a much larger attack surface. So when I'm looking, when I'm researching areas, uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll skip between a few, and I'll kind of like spend five minutes here, spend five minutes there, sp spend five minutes there in like an endless loop until I think I found something that's interesting, that really like is interesting to me, or um, I think I found a vulnerability or something cool to develop. And then I'll just laser in on that area. So a, a lot of my time is really spread between all sorts of areas until I find something that sparks my interest where I think I can do something cool. And I'd also say another thing that I've learned over the years is everything is vulnerable. Everything. If you look at something, you're going to find a vulnerability. So now it's less about hoping that it's going to be easier. It's like, if you look, you'll find something. <clears throat> A uh, question over here. Hello. Uh, Hello. I just wanted to ask, how do you make a living out of this? For example, you find some vulnerability, and what's what would you do after that? You contact the company and try to get a reward for that, or you publish that in in a magazine, or you give a speech about it. How uh, do you do? Uh, I am. I don't make too much money off security. This is like uh, this is really this is more of my my hobby. Um, I think it's. However, there are a lot of people who do bug bounty programs. I have friends who exclusively do bug bounty programs. All they do is they sit on Facebook, they look at pictures, and then they like look for vulnerabilities, and then switch back to pictures, and then switch back to vulnerabilities, and they find exploits in Google and Facebook, and then send yeah do the bug bounties. That's one way of making money. Um, you know, another thing that you could do is research. You could go to a company like Duo Security and do research for them. They actually have a research branch, a labs, where all they're doing is they're looking for new exploits and new vulnerabilities. <clears throat> and all they're doing that, they do that, and they issue patches, right? They're not monetizing that. Um, personally, I, I monetize development. So I do like software and hardware development. So right now I'm doing um, autonomous drone software and hardware. So I'm building drones that are actually that are capable of using computer vision and software to autonomously land, take off, fly, um, and do other interesting things. Sure. Thank you. Hello. As you said before. Uh, 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 Almost uh, everything is vulnerable. Uh, where do you think the line should be between caution and paranoia? Uh, I mean, I th everyone can draw their own line. Um, <clears throat> so I think about, I think about so sort of the risk, the pros and cons, right? By, by having a, a smartphone, I'm more prone to, to risks. Um, there's a lot, a lot larger attack surface here. In general, I might keep things off. I'll keep Bluetooth off if I don't use it. It's not a big issue to keep Bluetooth off for me. Um, some people who are more paranoid than me will just keep their phone off. I don't like waiting for this thing to start up and, and shut down, so that time is not worth it to me. I just, uh, you know, you have to find an acceptable level of, 
<clears throat> whether you think you'll be targeted, how important your information is, how bad is it if your information is leaked. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I would say personally, I'm okay with being hacked. Like, I'm going to be hacked. It's going to happen. Uh, so I'm just trying to accept it now so that when it happens, it's not a big surprise. Um, and because I love technology, I want to use this stuff. I, I want to use this technology. So I do leave myself a little bit more vulnerable than others, where I'd say if you're more paranoid and you care about your privacy more, you care about your information not getting leaked more, then I would say don't use certain features, right? If you can disable a feature of something, do it. Just in, in your phone, in your laptop, um, online, you know, use less cloud services. I use cloud services knowing that one of these cloud services is going to get hacked and my data is going to get leaked. Right? We can just assume that. Um, so it's, it's kind of what your, what your own risk assessment is and what your own paranoia level is, where you feel comfortable. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.